Hello, this is In Conservation with, I'm David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. In Conservation, for those who are new to it, is a series of Zoom interviews with, live interviews by the way, but you'll be watching it recorded on YouTube, I'm sure. Um, live interviews uh, with people who are movers and shakers within the world of conservation and people who might be directly involved in it, in the middle of it all, as scientists or people on the ground, ecologists or what have you doing the work, uh, through to some of the great thinkers and other people associated with conservation. So there's a whole range of people. And you can check all of that on the Urban Bird of World YouTube channel where you can find interviews with maybe 140 different people. So you can have plenty of uh, entertainment for the next year watching that. Tonight, today, this afternoon, my guest is a gentleman that I've known for a long time. He's, he's a, an amazing artist um, whose street name is ATM. But for those who don't know, I'm gonna reveal his real name. <laughs> um, and his real name is Mark. So, Mark, I'm very pleased to uh, to have you here again today. By the way, it's been, I think it's been just under two years because Mark was a guest two under two years ago um, on In Conservation with in our second series, ten months into the conception of In Conservation with, and we're in the midst of many um lockdowns and such things around the world at the time so uh mark firstly how are you and where are you i'm okay thank you um yeah i'm glad to be finally out of the lockdowns but still kind of feeling the repercussions a lot of people badly affected obviously by lockdowns a lot of social networks seem to disintegrate and there's been a kind of a general kind of malaise since a lot of people trying to reconnect and rebuild networks that it seems you know, as I, as so much moved online a lot of things have tended to stay online so it's been it's been difficult to rebuild um those structures that were working really quite well good okay and, and well we'll talk about that but uh, where are you now in the world i'm physically in west london okay and I'm, right and, I'm, um, and i just um the last mural that I painted was in a local park where um local fellow who walked his beautiful dog, which was half wolf, half Czech um, Alsatian, um, he, he uncovered um, a goldfinch trapping ring, an illegal goldfinch trapping ring. And he, yeah, he, he put an end to it. It was actually happening in the little park. And so I painted a mural of uh, four goldfinches on the wall of the W3 uh, pavilion in, um, in North Acton playing fields. So that was a really nice piece to do. And I did three of the goldfinches flying, one sitting on a, on a teasel head. So it shows that, um, yeah, celebrating the freedom of goldfinches. How long ago was that then? When, how long ago was this trapping going? Last year, it was going on last year. Really? Yeah, yeah. They're worth quite, they're worth a lot on the black market, little songbirds, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's all it's just for money, yeah. It's just incredible that that sort of thing is still occurring in a, in a country like Britain. I mean, yeah, I think of that happening in the Victorian ages. You know, obviously it still happens in in the Mediterranean and North Africa, of course, and elsewhere as well. But you don't yeah. look at it happening in the UK. Yeah, I know. yeah, I was quite surprised. It was really nice that local people managed to put a stop to it as well. You know, that was, you know, like local intervention. That's exactly what you need. People are aware of what was going on. So that was, um, yeah, I was pleased to do that. Well, that's good. I'm pleased to hear that too. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with ATM, um, he paints endangered species on urban walls, drawing attention to the environmental crisis to a wide audience by bringing huge images of our native fauna and our native fauna being usually in Britain, um, much of which is disappearing at an alarming rate, and we'll be talking about that later. By showing the beauty and significance of these creatures, he hopes to inspire interest, curiosity, and a desire to protect them and the habitats on which, on which they depend. Um, he brings colour and beauty to the public domain, that's for sure, behind me. 
um, and also he's 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 he um, he has painted or did paint. Or well, actually, I stole <laughs> the image of a a, a lapwing uh, for front cover of one of my books, which was uh, Tales from Concrete Jungles. Um, small individual individual changes repeated on a large scale can have dramatic positive effects. He believes but that by doing so, we would also create a healthier and more beautiful environment for ourselves. And he says that street art can play a valuable role in this cultural shift. Now, um, since we last spoke on, on this format um, on In Conservation With, how do you feel the cultural shift has, has, has gone? Has, has there been a cultural shift since what, 10 months, 10, well, two years ago nearly? I, I, I feel that things are getting worse, unfortunately. That, that, you know, that kind of resurgence in the care for the environment, um, it seems to be not, it seems to be going the opposite way, you know, with all the terrible stuff about sewage going into the river networks and all that, you know, it's like there are less and less um, controls and there's a lot of building on green belt land and things like that. So I, I don't, I can't, I find it really hard to be positive. That's why, I mean, the um, the things I'm, I most get encouraged about is individuals doing their own local kind of campaigns or, you know, making a difference on that level, because on the governmental level, I don't know, there are some good stories, but there seems to be a lot of, um, a lot of negative stuff as well. It's not, the environment isn't centre stage, that's for sure. And why, why isn't it? I mean, surely after all the years, the centuries, the millennia that we've been existing on this planet, surely we've gained the intelligence, the education to realise that, you know, we are standing on basically our life support system. Yeah. Why is it that we just, as a, as a, as a species, why is it? I mean, it's a question that I ask everyone. It's a question that no one can really answer, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I'm just despairing sometimes. Why is it that we don't learn? Why is it that, you know, governments, people that control what we do, basically, have no regard for the environment, or very little regard, it seems? Well, it's about power and control and money, basically. And um, there's not a lot of money in protecting the environment, unfortunately, but there is money in exploiting natural resources and uh, so and I don't, I don't think um, an another problem in modern times is that with you know social media and the revolution in AI and virtual realities that we're even more alienated and it's even easier to be detached from like you, like you said you know that which sustains us all it's easy to pretend that we don't depend on that and um, that's a big problem how to you know i've done lots of workshops with school children and work, worked outside you know collaborated with other people doing getting children gardening and all things like that or making things out of wood and so many children do they just think they're gonna it's all about getting dirty they hate it it's going to spoil their, their white trainers or whatever and whereas when i was a kid it was much more normal for kids to be playing out out and about, you know, you were climbing trees, you were, if you were lucky enough to, you know, like I was, you know, you had access to some kind of natural space or places. You, so you're just playing out outside. That was your entertainment. And uh, it's, it's the fact there's so much en entertainment is available 24 hours a day. You don't, you literally don't have to leave your room anymore. So how to change that and how to create that shift, you know, towards, um, people experiencing especially children experiencing the joys that come from contact with nature and you know the the sustenance that it gives you like being outside and experiencing the different seasons and the weather and you know different atmospheres and that, that nothing online or nothing virtual can ever give you but um, i think I, I think there's a bit of an um, a delusion that the virtual world can provide those things but i think that when you look at kind of the crisis in mental health and what have you, but as a consequence of all these things and the lockdowns, it shows that, you know, as human beings, we really are connected to the earth and we really do need those fundamental things of connection to the earth. 
that no amount of technology is going to re ever replace. But it's a bit of a fantasy that technology will replace our need for those things. Yeah, I, th I mean, I during lockdown, I think I realised that without realising it, if you know what I meant, because I had you know Netflix, I had all that sort of stuff. I sat sat in my house for three months in Spain under a draconian sort of lockdown. Yeah, and it drove me mad. I actually became depressed because I wasn't able to get outside. And yeah, exactly. you know, it was tough. Yeah. But anyway, listen, let me, um, for those who, who know very little about ATM and his work, I, I've got a video that um, he sent me actually, which I'm going to share with you now, um, just to kind of picture, give you the sort of picture as to what this, this man's about. And hopefully you can see all this um, clearly. Um, I will uh, press play and it should work. Hello, I'm the street artist ATM and I paint endangered species on urban walls as a call to arms as a way to reach the maximum number of people because so much more needs to be done to protect our native species and restore their habitats. They can be simple local things like not using weed killers, aphid sprays or slug pellets in our gardens as these kill the food supply birds depend upon. In my lifetime I've seen so many once familiar birds become rare Birds like lapwings and kestrels, which were such a constant part of my youth. Changes to farming to our landscape are happening so fast, which don't leave space for a healthy abundance of natural ecosystems to thrive. I always paint birds that have a connection to the location. They used to live here once and could again with habitat restoration. Snipe once drummed over the water meadows of the River Bollow in West London, which now flows beneath the tarmac like so many other rivers in our towns and cities. Most people don't know what these birds are, let alone that they used to live here, so my paintings act as a reminder. There's so much we can do on a small and local scale. Every little thing, every little action can have a huge positive cumulative effect. Local councils can plant fruit trees and planters around tower blocks as source of food for people and birds, or hedgerows on the edges of municipal lawns. Let hedges become wild edges, turn lawns into meadows, inspire local involvement. I think environmental art and public art can have a major role to play in this transformation of our cultural values. The missile thrush was a symbol of a local campaign to protect a patch of green space from development. Images of respect for other life rather than ubiquitous advertising of inanimate objects to be acquired might create a shift in perceptions of value where actions of value to the whole community usurp individual status. The presence of sparrowhawks is a sure sign of a healthy small bird population and a healthy ecosystem, so the sparrowhawk is painted as a symbol of that. Small birds need an abundant food supply of insects, seeds, so no pesticides, slug pellets, weed killers or aphid sprays. They kill the food supply or small birds depend on to feed their chicks. Leave lawns unmown until late summer, piles of logs and leaves all year round in the corner of your garden. One of the best things that can be done for the health and environment is to make a small pond. The Sparrowhawk was painted for a Friends of the Earth initiative to engage the whole community. It was called Ten Times Greener and involved people getting to know each other in regreening their street with window boxes, hanging baskets, planters, wildflowers around street trees, bird nest boxes and hedgehog boxes. Their template also includes a crowdfunder to pay a gardener to maintain the work. If we protect the water quality of our streams and rivers we also protect the whole web of life. All the invertebrates that the birds depend upon as well as all the fish, mammals and amphibians that interact to create a complex, abundant and thriving ecosystem. Walthamstow wetlands made from 10 reservoirs is now the biggest urban wetland in Europe.
Yeah, that was a fabulous film um, illustrating your work and basically just one question other than the uh, the idea of what we're going to be talking about, which is how, you know, how you see the world in terms of being a conservationist. It's just to talk about your art for a second, because this is, you know, it is central to what we're talking about tonight, today. Um, how do you get the perspectives? I mean, you're painting that goshawk and I'm thinking, you know, how, how do you know the, 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 the proportions? I mean, to, to be seen from, from that, from the, from, the, from the street, for example, how, how does that work? I have to keep going up and down ladders, loads. So basically, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't square things up or I don't use projections or anything like that. Or there's mobile apps now where you can kind of, you know, square things up. Or I like, I don't like, I like the process of actually imagining the bird or whatever on the wall and seeing it from different perspectives. As so, so I imagine myself to be someone walking down that street and seeing it. So when I um, place it on the wall, I will use kind of quite, you know, subtle exaggerations or change the perspective a bit or move things around a bit to get it to fit in the space of the wall. Like, and often like the, the painting behind you of um, Wolf and So Wetlands, that was, uh, that was it. When I was commissioned to do that, uh, the people were saying, oh, it's such a shame. There's a, you know, there's a satellite dish. There's all these windows in the way. But but in a way, when you're kind of at ground level looking at it like that, it's really nice to be able to fit things around that and to use those architectural features. So that's why I just like, I, I do everything by eye. And yeah, I have to come up, come down to the ground, walk to the other side of the street, think about it. And yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I mean, the the, the Wolfenstein Wetlands um, art behind me, I, I love because the fact that, as you say, you've incorporated the features of the building. And to me, that that basically, um, that basically says urban to me. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, it's nature around the man-made stuff. It's beauty yeah. am, amongst our stark, you know. Exactly, and it, and, it, and, it, and it makes that point exactly that nature can, fit around uh, the man-made stuff you know that it that that's um that it's possible for so many species to coexist alongside us if they've just got the right amount of habitats and the right spaces you know which um which could be so easily improved without a loss to the human space you know in so many urban parks for example you know it's just it's, bits of railings you know nobody actually treads on those areas the, you know there's they're kind of not used and they could be planted with hedgerows and uh, or all sorts of other things to create a dense a dense more habitable place for birds and other animals i'm really happy you said that you don't use any kind of uh, gadgets to help you square up the the, the painting oh. you walk off and look at it and use your brain i think i feel the same way when it comes to that chat GBT, GPT, whatever it is, you know, yeah. I would, I refuse, ref, I'd rather spend a month writing an email than to get AI to do it for me for 30 seconds, because it takes away the artistry, it takes away the creativity, I, I think, personally, you're not thinking yeah. for yourself. Well, exactly, because, you know, on those, on those mobile apps, basically, you do the design, can be on an A4 sheet of paper or whatever, and it and it just uh, repli it marks it out on the wall for you, however however big that wall is. So and if you do that, it doesn't account for the natural perspective of wall buildings. You know, when you're standing at a building looking up at it, uh, the perspective is kind of receding. So that affects the way you will see an image. And that's why, to my mind, a lot of street art looks quite flat. You know, you don't get a sense of its true scale. And I like to get a sense of each wall the true scale of it. And um, and as you say, you know, it's part of the process, the, that creative process where you're, you might be spending, you know, a lot longer doing that, but you're thinking about this, you're thinking about that, you know, you, that is, for me, that is the whole joy of why I do what I do. Right, you know, otherwise you're kind of copying something you've already done and I, I, or, you know, or you get even worse getting something else to help you do it. So it's the actual process, which is the main thing. The process, it's a process of discovery as you, you know, and, and why street art is so nice 
they're so interesting is because every wall is completely different in that respect and it's got a different surface like the the one the wealth Walthamstow wetlands one you know it has a kind of quite an unusual artex um swirl all going across it which is incredibly hard to paint on because everything had to be stippled but it creates it's much nicer than um, a plain wall because it creates these unusual rhythms so it had a kind of water effect as well so you know i could i could use that as well which is but every wall is completely different so that is, is i find it much more exciting than just painting on a canvas a rectangular canvas yeah i guess one time a while ago not that long ago your kind of work on public spaces would have been deemed as graffiti um now it seems that attitudes have changed towards street art and i'm seeing you know not only your work but i'm seeing other people not only doing various other bits and pieces but i see a lot of bird art now um in spain where i am there's whole sides of buildings with white stalks and things planted on there um that's obviously a good thing though yeah yeah no that's great yeah there's a lot more people painting birds yeah than there were a few years ago definitely uh, i like to see that i think this yeah the more of that the better really and when you're painting, because I noticed in the, the clip that you, you showed us, um, a little girl walking past and looking, what was the reactions um, by the local residents as you were painting? Were most people appreciative or do you get people saying, what are you doing, mate? <laughs> you know? I always get one or two of them, what are you doing, mate? But 99% are really appreciative, you know. People will say thank you and, uh, you know, they'll say thank you for you know making their environment look nicer and they'll, they'll always ask me why i'm doing it and what it is i'm painting you know it's quite surprising how few people know what these birds are you know really so but but that gives you an opportunity to kind of explain the history of it and um, talk about what the birds are and you I, you know you get um <clears throat> surprising exceptions as well you know like um these two builders went past in a, in a van when I was painting the Chaffinch in, um, you know, in uh, Brixton. And one, they just shout that nice Chaffinch, mate, you know, and it's just, so you think, oh, it's really nice when um, you realise that people appreciate birds, you know, you, you know, you wouldn't necessarily assume would. So it's, it's good. So that's part of the process as well, because it takes a few days for me to paint each one. So I always have some really interesting conversations along the way which is which is part of again which is that's part of the whole process it's amazing that that guy recognized that it was a chaffinch i mean that's pretty uh that's pretty good going i know i was surprised yeah. um we were talking you know before we started recording about conservation and it's something that i've been talking about a lot this series i've had a few people in from the rspb over the last couple of months um, talking about their various aspects, aspect, aspects of work. Um, but what's always concerned me for, for years, you know, ever since I was a kid, I, I always felt that I could not go there in terms of being a, a volunteer on a nature reserve. Um, because for me, that meant being somewhere remote in Scotland, which I would have loved, but then it would have also meant having to pay my own way and not being paid. And I remember yeah. once being um, on Alderney in the Channel Islands um, and I was, um, you know, I was, I was with the Alderney Wildlife Trust and I was with a couple of volunteers and they basically said, you know, we have to pay our own rent, we have to yeah. pay everything and they don't get paid anything, mm. which makes you think, how can you afford it? And obviously you can afford it because, you know, you have parents or you have savings that, you know, that can support you. But for the average person, given the way that the economy is going, um, I was reading only a couple of days ago about 30% or maybe more of people in the UK are struggling to make ends meet in a, yeah. in a very serious way. Yeah. That kind of is a massive problem. In addition to the top end of the, of the spectrum, which is the government and their sort of blindness to lots of aspects of, of conservation and the environment, but then the very people that could be volunteers that could be, you know, really geared up to try to to save the environment, for want of a better phrase, can't 
the barrier there is is money. Yeah, it's a major problem. And even paid jobs in conservation now, they're nowhere like rising with inflation, you know. So there are so many jobs paid, they're just above the, the minimum wage. So like you say, unless you've got money behind you, it's kind of becoming impossible. And so, I mean, some people will kind of live on just about on the breadline because of the passion and love they feel for these things. But it really shouldn't be like that. You, should, you know, like you say, massive organisations like the RSPB, they could afford to... I mean, they're, they're, they're completely reliant on volunteers, but those volunteers, by definition, they're, 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 they're either retired, comfortably retired, or they're people with, you know, parents who've got money or other, other sources of income. So it, it cuts out a huge proportion of the population who, who could do really positive things simply because they um yeah they haven't got anywhere to stay and they they haven't got enough money to live on it's it's really sad that i don't know i don't <clears throat> that would need a, a real complete shift in um perspective though from the big organizations because they've often got money but um they they don't want to spend it on that they 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 they're relying on the uh, volunteer structure of their organizations and i suppose if they started to pay some people in one sector they then have to pay everybody else so it's, it's probably a bit of a dilemma for them how to do that i think that sometimes um nature conservation or people involved in conservation are expected to do things for free you yeah know, even, you know at my end of the scale where you know I'm, I'm doing things people approach me often and ask me to do quite major things you know can you be with us all day can you do this can you do that and when you ask about well you know <laughs> how are you going to sort of support that financially and they say oh we weren't thinking you're going to ask for money yeah. you know and it's, it's also when you get asked to do things on tv or radio often money doesn't come into it no. about no. it you know i no. remember I remember one time being approached by the BBC, no less, um, to, to do, to, to sort of contribute to a program about rivers and the pollution. And I said, yeah, fine, it sounds great. You know, they organized the, where we're gonna meet and all that sort of stuff. And then the moment we talked about money, or at least my agent talked about money, radio silence, they ghosted me. Never heard from them again. Hello, hello. Or they'll tell they'll tell you flat out, um, like big media companies, we don't have a budget for this. <laughs> There's no budget. You know, we'll pay we'll pay your bus fare and we'll buy your sandwich and that's it, kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, it's laughable really to, for them to say they haven't got a budget, but that's 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 their that's their standard practice. So yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, again, it's 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 tricky. I mean, what you say about you know, like that used to be the case. And often it's still the case, you know, for artists that it's assumed that, you know, an artist is doing it purely for the love of what they're doing and they will be grateful for the opportunity without without consideration that we are, we also have to kind of survive and live, you know, in this ex increasingly expensive world, you know. So, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny assumption that people make. So I guess that, you know, the way that things are economically, I mean, I've, I've seen it anyway. It's affecting the art world, isn't it? It's affecting artists because yeah. often they are some of the first people to be really badly hit, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. A lot of artists and musicians I speak to, they um, last year was a bad year, you know, particularly bad. Um, I was talking to this guitarist fellow I know, um, and he, but he was, he said. Um, He's hopeful that he's got a feeling this year is going to be better. There's going to be a bit of a bounce back. So let's ho let's hope so. I think there was an aftershock from um, the lockdowns and a lot of a lot of systems just closing down, and then the shock of all the huge heights in utility utility bills. But maybe um, organisations are starting to adapt to that a bit now. So they you know they're freeing up some funds that can start to relax a little bit. I don't know, but. Hopefully there will be a shift. But yeah, last year was a strange year. L lots of things got, just got cancelled or didn't happen. How are things, yeah. how, how things going for you as an artist? Well, yeah, like I said, last year it was, you know, like the, the public work that I was doing for the Wildlife Trust and all the organisations like that. 
um, uh, slowed down, but um, I've got things planned for you know this year now so hopefully it'll be a bit better but um i'm, I'm doing other things as well i've i've, um, I've got my uh, shop on my website set up so i'm doing smaller you know i've done a whole series of paintings on banknotes which i find really interesting because i can explore the relationship between money and exploitation of the natural world uh, by putting um paintings of bird endangered birds on particular countries banknotes so I'm doing a whole new series of them and I'm doing a lot of um, smaller paintings on canvases and yeah, drawings and trying out different styles, trying brush drawings and things like that. So yeah, it's been, it's, so it's been an interesting year in that respect. So it's made me think about a lot of um, different approaches to art as well. Do you, um, you've been working on a few projects because you were telling me earlier. Um, can you tell us about that? Because you, you know, I know that you are slightly despairing regarding the situation, certainly in Britain and conservation and how the environment has just been trounced effectively. But you've you've been you've been and seen a few interesting small um, projects going on, such as the the one um, regarding or protecting the fen raft spider, and is that, was that in Suffolk? Yeah, because that was. Um... That's a really great story. I, I was working with uh, Suffolk Wildlife Trust. I did a whole set. I did eight murals in Lowestoft area. It was all about because um, they got a big grant from Heritage Lottery to buy a whole lump of um, farmland adjoining their Carlton Marshes Reserve. And uh, so I, I've been doing these murals over the years, and hopefully I'll be doing some more actually um, with, with them. In the, you know in the in the future, but um, yeah, so I actually witnessed they they did a huge kind of land management scheme. There was bulldozers going, you know, they were destroying some of the old dikes. They were making scrapes, making lagoons. So there was all this heavy earth moving machinery reclaiming this farmland that had just been sterile farmland and um, turning it into ideal um, wildlife habitat. And so and that is where. Um, I saw the Fenrath spiders, and um, there was a local woman, uh, what's she called, um, Helen Smith. She um, she um, she raised these baby spiders, each in an individual test tube. She had three thousand of them, and she fed them individually with little flies. You know, so it's an incredibly labour. She she individually fed three thousand spiders. Yeah. yeah, baby spiders. Yeah. Because it was on the it was on the edge of disappearing, you know. It was like in the the Fenroth spider was in a couple of very isolated um, like locations, and um, I think they brought um, they brought individuals from both populations to increase the genetic strength, and then um, yeah, bred them, and then they re um, yeah, they released them into the fens, and uh, they're there. They're there. It's a, it's a success, and so it, it was the efforts of an individual, really. Obviously, she had support on that, but it, it was absolutely, you know, the commitment of an individual that's, that's completely you know, brought um, a species back from close to extinction. And I was actually going to paint a Fenroth spider in the middle of lower stuff, but um, the the trust they, they did some kind of they tested the water and a lot. It was, it was on a big wall, um, like overlooking near the station. So it was, just, it was a, a big high wall. And this Fenrath spider was going to be kind of climbing down the wall. But too many people were, were like scared of the idea, you know, because spiders, you know, can, you know, it might have created nightmares in the populace. So in the end, I painted a kingfisher on that wall. So, so <laughs> I've yet to paint the spider, but they are incredibly beautiful. And when you see them, the way they were just the word, glide across the water because they've got these special hairy legs which means they just sit on top of the water you know they don't break the surface tension of the water so they and these and they're really big about um, five centimeters across yeah wouldn't yeah. wouldn't it have been amazing if you would have done a banksy and just did one overnight you know yeah i mean banksy did stuff in low i mean it was really funny actually because at the time i was doing my um series of birds banksy went to lowest often did um did a seagull and 
there was a skip and a load of big polystyrene blocks and this ski go- seagull was apparently you know uh, eating chips out of this out of this skip you know and um, I got asked if it was one of mine or it was one of well, part of the same the same kind of scheme of work because uh, it, you know they were dotted around the town but yeah we didn't collaborate on that I used to um, take out Banksy's ex ex manager birding because he's a he's a a budding birder and I used to take him on these very oh, well, trips yeah to Scotland but this guy was very secretive even he was secretive he would say look let's go somewhere in the middle of Scotland you know no one around um I don't want to talk to anyone and if we get into a hide and people come in I'm telling you now I'm leaving and that's what he did you know we were in a hide people came in out he went so I had to follow him follow him out wow. one time we're walking um in this remote area um near the Isle of Sc- well the Isle of Skye was opposite so the mountains on the mainland were walking on this road in a remote road and I remember a car driving past us screeching to a halt reversing four birders jump out David David I was thinking Jesus in the middle of Scotland <laughs> you know yeah, of course I turn around and this guy is gone but he used to tell me that when he was out with Banksy um they would go off in the middle of the night and they'd wear um you know lum- lum- luminescent jackets yeah um and put up cones yeah and it just gives that impression that they're workmen so people yeah, don't yeah, yeah. take any any notice at all it's just that, fascinating yeah. Yeah, how, yeah. how how that happened really yeah it's the power of the high vis jacket yeah it can get you in anywhere right. yeah and there was one art thing i was involved with years ago actually uh, now that i remember um, do you remember this? There was an organisation called Lynx who were anti-fur people. Okay, yeah, yeah. This was back in the nineties, and I, I was working with a couple of friends who were sort of high-flying people in advertising, creatives, and they were doing some work for Lynx. So they got um, a series of artists to paint billboards around London, and there was one billboard um, in. West Kensington or some, some posh area in Kensington and I remember it was that night we were painting at two in the morning I wasn't but they were and it was a skinned uh rabbit I think they were putting up painting and mm. a gentleman came up to us to inquire what was going on and it was it was it was Francis Bacon the artist oh. Oh, he was asking what was going on. Yeah, he came up to us and he said, oh, this is, this, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I just, I heard of his name. But I didn't really know who he was, but wow. yeah. Francis Bacon. It was incredible because he must have lived around the corner and he was, must have been coming yeah. up from somewhere. So it's amazing to uh, to bump into or have someone come up to us and it turns out to be Francis Bacon. It's incredible. Wow. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but basically you're saying um, that a lot of these small projects these these are the things that are really making a difference in many ways i mean you tell us about the glowworm project you you, t- you t- told me about that was some i don't know that much about it but i just read about this fellow peter cooper who um took it upon himself to um, start um reintroducing glowworms and obviously they suffer a lot from light pollution but he um he started um, breeding them yeah they they, the the larva apparently um, feed on snails and slugs, baby snails and baby slugs. So he just he, he was he kept them in a nice humid environment, bred them and released them at um, appropriate sites. And uh, there was a similar um, thing with the, the tansy beetle in York. I painted the tansy beetle in York, and um, that was once widespread throughout the country, but it's dependent on this tansy plant, this yellow flowering plant. And they don't fly tansy beetles. They, and the maximum distance between patches of tansy is like 200 meters. So any more than that, <laughs> they won't be able to find um, new plants and they won't be able to reproduce. And so, um, so they've slowly disappeared with the loss of mixed agriculture and what have you, and uh, loss of um, tansy plants along the river ooze. But um, yeah, there was um, just a small organization started breeding them and uh, they've reintroduced them right in the center of York. So that, you know, it just takes a few people to do these things and it, so it can have um, really dramatic effects. So it's great. I, I love hearing that. Those stories do give me hope. They really yeah. do. And also, for example, you know, like Roy Dennis and um, 
the whole um, sea eagle reintroduction, you know, that was considered um, an impossibility, you know, like there's not enough space for massive eagles. And yet the first one, the first pair just bred in England for the first time in like since 1780, apparently. And uh, and, and they're, it's expand, expanding, you know, they're, they're on the Isle of Wight. And so, so, and there's, you know, there's the ongoing discussion about links being reintroduced and there's, you know, links could be here now and we, people wouldn't even know they're so secret and they're so. That's the thing um, that frustrates me about Britain. Um, going back to the seagull, for example, people saying, oh, how can such a big bird that can't, you know, that can't possibly exist there, it's not enough space. You go into Europe, you see white-tailed sea eagles flying around cities like Belgrade. I'm seeing them flying around. Who? No one, no, no one even notices them. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. There's there's a worry that they will eat livestock. Yeah, that's always a, that's always a concern. But I mean, with the with the eagle, apparently they were they were worried that they would scare all the uh, the geese and all the all the estuary birds away. You know, uh, you know, it's that kind of don't understand how ecology works birds don't disappear just because there's predators around you know they, they, they they don't. Co yeah they coexist i mean i remember yeah, being in, Est in estonia standing on a platform watching five thousand barnacle geese and they were yeah. amongst or near them was seven uh white-tailed eagles and yeah. one of them flew off into the flock part of the flock flew grabbed one took it back started eating it the rest of the flock to settle down again. I mean, it's just these people need to look at what's happening elsewhere. Exactly. It's yeah. like it's like with the um the the links, as you said correctly. Who would know if it's here? No one would know because even in Europe, people don't see them. You know, no. um, and I think we had someone on recently, well, a couple of years ago, we were talking about um re re rewilding, and basically saying that um in Europe. They don't take livestock apart from one in one country actually i think it's sweden because these animals hang out in woods they don't walk around farmland and ah. in sweden the the shepherds put you know put their sheep within the forests and that's where sometimes one oh, can yeah. take but yeah, because... you know imagine lynx in clumber forests in nottinghamshire or you know up in scotland they'll be just he eating roe deer and getting on with their lives and no one will know a thing Exactly, and there's lo there's loads of uh, you know secluded places in Scotland where they could live. You're, yeah, and you, nobody would never know. They wouldn't venture out into farmland at all. They wouldn't need to. Exactly, um, but you know, as as we all know, children are the, the the very important element in all this because you know the world's ruled by old men um, at the moment. Um, you taught. So you told me about a project in Lowestoft about the, the kitty wakes. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Um, basically, it's like the, the Lowestoft, uh, what's it called? The, um, the kitty, lo, yeah, the Lowestoft kitty wake project. And it's, it's got the RSPB involved and it's got um, like local schools, local businesses. And the problem is that um, because um, Kittiwakes, there's there's a, a lack of in that area. There's a lack of natural nesting sites. They they choose buildings. I actually the the mural that I actually painted of the kingfisher that I told you about. Um, it was it was about it was quite healthy. It's about sixty feet off the ground, and um, I was painting on one face of the building. And when I put my head around the corner, I was on eye level with the lady kittiwake nest. You know that was a fantastic experience, but. Um, the businesses below, some of them had put netting up because there was just this one one part of this building where they were allowed to nest, but there was a lot of mess and all that. And, and of course, they make a lot of noise. So businesses were putting netting up and um, some of the birds were getting trapped in the netting. And so this, this project was trying to liaise with building owners to try and find a solution because um, Lowestoft is a real kind of little stronghold for kittiwakes. And I went, I painted a kitty wake in a primary school, uh, Northfields Primary School. And um, part of what I did, I went in, after I painted the mural, I went in there and I did, I did this workshop 
with every single class in the whole school. It was, it was quite a big school, so it was just the same thing repeated and repeated. But but every kid in that school was talking about kitty wakes. I mean, they were they were part of the curriculum. They'd all, they were already been discussing kitty wakes and what they were. And then we made we made some stencils and um, put uh, like little white um, silhouettes of kitty wakes in the playground outside on the wall. And um, but I thought it was great because. Every child in that school now knows what a kitty wake is. I think most people wouldn't know the difference between, they're just all gulls, you know, seagulls to most people. And yeah, um, kitty wake's obviously unique species. And I just thought it was great that every every child, and they probably remember that all their lives, what a kitty wake is. So that was really effective and really good. And uh, I just thought that was a really nice, yeah, I like to be part of that thing. So I'm combining my painting with this kind of educational stuff and talking to children about also about art as well which is really nice and you know about following one's dreams because you know i was always told oh you can't it's impossible to make a living as an artist you can't be an artist you're you're a dreamer you know get a proper job you know you've got to get a serious job earn a, earn a proper living and then do that in your spare time that kind of approach and um, i was told that multiple times even you know art college as well you know, I was a fool and a dreamer for thinking I could make a living out of out of painting. So I like to kind of tell kids, you know, if they're really passionate about something, you know, follow it, you know, go go with it and see where it takes you. So so that yeah, so that was a, that's a really good project. It's combined all the different things that I really like. Yeah, well, good on you, Mark, for saying that to the kids. I mean, it's so important to get that message across. I mean, I was told in my early careers as the urban birder that. In fact, I was told by some people to give it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I guess when you know that there is a, a story to be told and there's things to be sort of imparted, then yeah. that just takes over. What are your feelings, your unfettered feelings about conservation in the future? Do you think we are in a good place? Do you think that there are people behind us to take all this stuff on. Um, let me just um, sort of broaden that a bit because I made uh, a comment once in front of some young conservationists saying, you know, there is no kind of Chris Packham. I can't, I look behind me and I can't see another Chris Packham. I can't see anyone else like that. And someone turned around to me and said, but the thing is, you know, that's that's old school there's a new type of thing now which may not be describable but there's a new way of doing things so i guess i sat back and thought well maybe i should have faith in something which i can't see yet or i can't equate um because i only know what i do and what people i i look up to do and what people have in the past have done how do you feel the future is do you think there is enough people out there who care who can make a difference do you think the way forward is to be more volatile and be you know more like just stop oil you know how, how is this going to play out because you know we are looking at a very serious situation now environmental crisis at the moment and climate change crisis how do we make this difference uh, I mean, there, there are some kind of, or well, there have been recently quite influential young young speakers, you know, like I remember listening to Bella Lack speak and they're very passionate, you know, there are a lot of kind of teenagers. I'm not quite sure what became of them, but there was definitely a real interest, you know, from the media and from publishers in those young voices. So there's de they definitely do exist. Uh, but whether or not they're enough to really cre help create a shift in priorities, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not really in a position to know that, I don't think, because um, they're not really my peers. So I don't... Um, I'm, ho I'm hopeful that uh, there will be something. Because whenever things get really bad, whenever there's real crisis, there's always, there's always, um, there's always a kind of counter movement against that and things are getting really bad now I, th I think a lot more people are waking up to the damage that's being done 
and uh, so the question is how much will people take all this isn't it well how, how long is it before people really start to resist what's going on but right and also like in in terms of the the value of nature i mean i know it's been recognized in the scientific literature, more and more the value of contact with the natural world for mental health and physical well-being. It's even being prescribed by GPs, you know, to go for walks in nature. And that was that was never the case. So it's definitely a recognition of of the need for something to kind of fill the void of people's alienation or you know despair or whatever you want to call it you know as, and as, especially as things get more difficult then that's even more important so i think on a, on a local level there are people who recognize that and uh, put really pushing for it so but whether that will translate into government um policy i don't know and i, I, I think much faith in politicians of the moment to be honest uh, well, who has i mean I, I guess a lot of people have actually but um i certainly don't um, I guess also it's to do with ignorance, which is not meant as a neg negative thing because some, you know, we just, some people just don't understand um, how this whole work, the whole thing works. I mean, the whole ecology works. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes that's used against us in many ways in terms of, oh, don't worry, you know, you don't, you don't know. So we just, we'll just do it anyway because you won't notice. Yeah. And it even comes down to being in, in urban areas and seeing the tree surgeons hacking at trees to the point. I mean, I, I, I know some gardens um, uh, in southern England um, where, I mean, they're public, I mean, not public gardens, but they're private gardens, but the council have come in. There was a, some beautiful trees that were really full, voluminous, and I even suspected tawny owls being in there. Yeah. And I got a, pho a photo from one of the residents the other day, and the trees are be completely pollarded, completely like mm. stunted, chopped to pieces. Mm. There'll never be a tawny owl in there now for the next couple of years at least. Not even wood pigeons, nothing. I mean, it's just completely destroyed without mm. even a thought as to what could be living there. And, and let's have some beauty. I mean, I guess yeah. on the other hand, they're they're excuse is the fact that you know we need to do this because regulation five of section b whatever says what we need to have more, you know trees can't grow to a certain height and they need to allow light through and stuff but it's just sometimes i see it being so the environment becomes so manicured I don't know. Yeah. It, it just it, it becomes and, it, and it's done before you can even say anything there's no yeah. word. it's just done you wake up next morning and it's done um yeah i mean beautiful street trees where um, around where I live you know they've because they're kind of quite old trees they've they've changed the shape of the pavement a bit so it's a bit bumpy you know a bit of a lump and they've just they just chop these beautiful trees down and then replace it with a sapling without actually correcting the pavement itself so I don't quite understand the um, the logic of that at all but that happens all over the place mature trees replaced by little small trees yes yeah, it's, it's madness yeah. Yeah. Um, one final question before we um, we see this um, episode out. Um, and we were talking about this prior to pressing the record button, and that was carbon footprints. Um, I've mentioned this a few times and in conservation with, so I don't bore the regular people. Um, but it's it's when you have situations where people are pointing fingers at other people, saying, "What are you doing?" Uh, and and trying to call them out on the carbon footprint. Mm. Um, I don't know how you feel about it, but it kind of annoys me a bit because you know it's almost like he with or you whoever without sin cast the first stone. I mean, yeah, that's, exactly. that's how it is to me. Yeah, well, we're all um, we're all consuming energy all the time if we live in a house and we've got our kind of modern conveniences. So it's quite, we're, we're, you know, if we start pointing the finger at other people, we're on kind of quite shaky ground, really, because unless we actually go and live in the woods off grid and um, live off the land, uh, we, we're all part of the, uh, the economic situation we live in. So I don't quite, I mean, we can try and reduce waste as much as possible. And of course, you know, like excess of um, 
travel maybe is a bad thing, but going on a plane the old time, I don't know. The the um the whole way the world is uh, structured, the way that the fact that car you know, those massive container ships <coughs> those which produce as much um emissions as like I think one ship produces the same emissions as the whole all the cars of Europe. And there's one um whose liner company, I think it's got thirty nine ships these big cruise ships, and, and they produce as, mu as, as much emissions as all the cars in Europe as well. So, I mean, where do you stop? You know, where do you, where do you draw the line? I don't know. I don't know. It's, the problem is, is just so much bigger than uh, individual actions, isn't it, really? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, yeah, it's always a difficult one, difficult one to question, difficult one to answer even, shall I say. Um, question for you, last question. If you can paint any thing on any wall anywhere in the world, what would it be? I want to paint a curlew in Kings Lynn. Kings Lynn in, in Norfolk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a curlew action. Um, they, they've got the first um, curlew work, field workers workshop, and there's people coming all over from um, all over Europe. And um, hopefully, I'm going to paint the curlew because curlews literally are. Um, they're on the verge of disappearing from this country. So I think that's, you know, that's absolutely worthy campaign to try and uh, reverse that. And that's happened suddenly, you know, in the last few decades. So that's what I want to paint the curlew. Absolutely. Okay, well, that's great. Mark, thank you very much for being my guest for the second time. Always a pleasure to see your lovely face and, and listen to uh, or have great conversation with you about stuff. Um, we often talk when we meet at various uh, functions. We last saw each other in um, in Lancashire, didn't we? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So thank you. I'm um, coming up, Zoomers. Just to let you know, um, this week um, on Thursday we have Alvaro Jaramillo, um, who is a, an amazing uh, birder. Um, he lives in. Uh, California, I think it comes from Chile, and he is very interested in making notes and observations on on birds. And he's going to talk to us about desert petrels. Yes, you heard me right. Desert desert petrels. Petrels are actually breeding deserts way away from the sea. Um, uh, on Monday, the 29th of January, we've got Stephen Menzi back. Um, he is going to be talking about life at Falsterbo bird observatory in Sweden, where he is the manager. On January the 30th, we've got a guy called Dorian Anderson, who I spoke about previously. He's the guy that's uh, who, who he had a massive addiction problem in the past, and he kind of cured it by cycling across America to count as many birds as he saw. So we'll be talking to him. Um, we have James McDonald Lockhart on February the 5th, that's a Monday, talking about uh, or, yeah, talking about being in search of birdsong. Um, Georgie Bray from the RSPB will be talking on the 12th of uh, March, on Tuesday, about farming for nature. So that's just a few of what's going to be happening. Um, keep an eye out on the Urban Bird of World website. What's coming up next is a Q&A. If you are a member of the Urban Bird of World community, you can see that with no problem. But if you're not, then you need to be a member. So check out the umbirdaworld.com, become a member, and you can see all the Q&As for all of the um, In Conservation webs over the last three or four years now. So without any more rabbit from me, I'd like to thank Mark for being here tonight. Thank you very much for, for just having a chat with me and chewing the card or whatever you want to say, and just uh, also telling us about part as well. Thanks very much. And Zoomers, thank you very much for your patience and being here again. And all I can say at this point is keep looking up.